<coughs> Vaibhav Sangvi, MD and uh, fund manager at Ambit joins us, one of the fund gurus, if I can call him, of the markets at the moment. Uh, thank you so much for joining us, sir. Uh, you know, I'm going to, I know you can't talk stocks and therefore I'm not going to ask you about stocks, but I just want to get a sense of what has happened with the numbers in Q1. Uh, since the last quarter or so, in the last few months, we've been talking about a recovery, signs of recovery coming in, um, in, especially in consumption and even cement. Now, if I look at the numbers which have come out, and as I, I'm repeating, I'm not asking you about stocks, Q1 till now has been disappointing. Yes, it, it, it has been disappointing in the sense that uh, the biggest heavyweight, which is uh, the technology sector, uh, you know, in spite of this being one of those strongest quarters, usually on, in terms of seasonality, uh, they have disappointed on the revenue line for sure. Uh, it, it is extremely tough for them then to uh, now go and achieve their yearly guidance uh, in the light that uh, we have gone past the strongest quarters and uh, that the Brexit fears or the Brexit effect uh, is still to yet to be seen on the sector. So what we think is basically, you know, uh, the est earning estimate for the consensus in terms of the street of about 17 to 20 percent, anyway between that, uh, one has to see accelerated the performance for off earnings in the last uh, two quarters of this year. So it, it, it is, you know, uh, it is in a situation where we'll, we'll continue to keep on hoping about those earning recoveries. Uh, my take would be uh, wait for the earnings recovery to happen and then probably we'll take a call. Okay, IT, of course, uh, it, some say that the game has changed for IT. This was the beginning of that indication. Uh, you know, if I take a company like Infosys and I'm using it as an example, not to get your call on it. Um, Infosys was down and out, they changed the CEO, the CEO came in, there was a huge recovery, a lot of buoyancy sense, this is strategic change. Uh, now there seems to be a sense perhaps uh, Mr. Sikka was more a great salesman, he was able to go to people, sell his company again and get that. Strategically, entire IT is now affected. It's going to be difficult, not just this year's guidance, but it's difficult for IT to remain a high growth industry, the way in which technology has changed now. Would you agree? Yes. So, uh, in the case of technology, you know, there are two factors. One, do we, uh, we have to assess that, is it that, that the environment has completely changed in terms of the spending not happening in the IT? Uh, I, I doubt uh, that is the case. Two, uh, then where is the money going? I think it is going into, you know, into differentiated products, into services which can be of huge amount of value add to the business. So, if the traditional IT companies, uh, you know, if their services are being commoditized, then you will surely see uh, these companies go and lag uh, going forward. Mm -hmm. If they do not turn uh, their business model around for uh, you know, maybe artificial intelligence, automation, uh, and high value add products in terms of consulting, uh, you will see, uh, you know, these con companies continue to suffer. So what we think is basically any differentiated business model, product based model, uh, which can, uh, you know, beat the industry growth uh, is something where we would want to be. Uh, otherwise, I think it would, it, it, it is a story of a slow grind down in terms of a PED rating uh, over a longer period of time. Right. Um, okay. Um, you know, that's IT. IT, of course, is a, a double whammy. You have a global slowdown and the North America and all these people haven't really got that kind of growing demand because of which IT hasn't done as well as expected. And then there is the technology change, as you were mentioning, cloud, automation, a lot of things coming, changing, and therefore Indian IT is behind. There are companies which are exposed to India. And again, as examples, I'm sorry, I know you're not supposed to stock, talk stocks, but for our viewers, I just need to take these examples. You don't have to comment about them. I'm just looking at HUL and I'm looking at um, uh, Ultratech numbers. Both of these are domestic, largely, um, almost entirely, if I'm, I would have to say. There was talk that spending has happened, uh, there is rural consumption taking place, urban consumption has revived, there's a bit of pricing power that has come into play. Top line will grow. Pressure in terms of the commodity cycle coming up again could put m pressure on margins. Now, that was true for uh, a company like HUL. You took at cement, 
we had great dispatches numbers. Our, uh, I mean, the analysts said that uh, a company like Ultratech would get 10%, 9 to 10% volume growth. It ended up with a 6% volume growth. Now, to me, it appears that we have appeared to have overestimated the kind of demand revival in both consumption and in the materials business, and that has not really worked out. Would you agree with that? Well, that's a very good observation. I mean, if you see uh, the uh, consumption and the materials basket, any which in our expectation is more of a Q3 and Q4 story because uh, we'll have to wait for the monsoon to completely pan out and rise in disposable income uh, of farms. Uh, so once the sowing happens, once uh, you know they are out with the crop, they have money into their hands, and that is when you will see increased consumption. Having said that, at the same time, you have seventh pay commission uh, implementation. So I think the effect of which I think will be evident in Q3 and Q4. If somebody is looking for the recovery in earnings, probably on a consumer facing uh, uh, you know sectors. In, in this quarter and next quarter, mm. I, I think the, the, the expectations are little misplaced. Mm. And that is why I say that, you know, having an expectation or estimates of 70 to 20% for the whole year of earnings growth, we think that number is going to get downgraded a bit, uh, you know, across the street. Mm. Uh, in important. anticipation of those high growth numbers, in, in anticipation of those uh, high numbers, we've already rallied and expanded the market PE now, mm. uh, you know, to, to a very rel I mean, relevant and material level. So we need to have a uh, follow-up on earnings recovery. Mm. 17 to 18% earnings uh, growth, you, you're saying that we were expecting, and this, these are FY17 growth figures that you're talking about? Yes, these are FY17. The street is between 17 to, you know, anyway between uh, actually 16 to 20%. Yeah, so where would you now put it in that, uh, within that range? Where would you now come down to? So our, our estimates right from the beginning, uh, it's not now, but right from the beginning was anywhere between 10 to 15 percent. And why 15 percent is purely because if the monsoons are great, then we might see those kind of earnings, you know, getting nearer towards 15 percent. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but we definitely think uh, that 16 to 20 percent is a stretch. 16 to 20 percent is a stretch. 10 to 15 percent was your original estimate. Now, if monsoons are great, you're more towards that 15 percent end of the range, right? Would that, would that be fair to say? Yes. All right. Even 15 percent means that all the uh, Sensex or Nifty earnings that have been predicted will have to be re-rated re re -rate, a little bit, and which means that the market currently overall uh, looks pretty overvalued from your lens. Perfect. So what, what, what generally happens is basically in the light that, uh, you know, where we are seeing huge amount of emerging market inflows, mm. this uh, premium over the emerging markets or over the global markets mm. might continue to stay for some period of time. Mm. Uh, but whenever you see uh, that risk of sentiment coming back uh, into the global markets, you might see some amount of ugly reaction uh, in the light if mm. the earnings do not support uh, our growth. Mm. Uh, so yes, we have seen P re-rating on the higher side. Mm. Uh, two, we are at the receiving or not, at the good end uh, of receiving uh, global flows into India. Mm. Uh, it's just that something goes wrong. Uh, mm. If it's something goes wrong, you will see some amount of nasty outflows uh, from the emerging market basket and thereby affecting India as well. Mm. Uh, if you, uh, again, just to uh, give you some perspective on the numbers, coming on back to that earnings, we are, uh, you know, the street estimates about 16 to 20% and at that point in time, we are at about 19 times uh, FI 17 earnings. Mm -hmm. Now, mm -hmm. that's, that's a little on the higher end of our PE bands. Uh, so, I'm not saying uh, that... So, uh, at, you at know, your, within, if I take the midpoint yeah. of your range, then that is, that is significantly over very, very expensive market. If I take it, uh, let's say that we achieve that 12 to 13 percent earnings growth, then right now we are significantly expensive. We are expensive. I would not say significantly expensive because, you know, we don't know actually, you know, how the Q3 and Q4 will come. If, All right. If Q3 and Q4 comes comes perfectly in line, mm. then we'll have, we ourselves also will have to revise the numbers upwards. All right, okay. That, that, that's uh, something to take heart from. Now, uh, my uh, question is that while it is, all right, uh, I'm just going to interrupt for a second, uh, sir, because LIT Infotech has uh, listed 
it's uh, just 10 o'clock right now, down 18 rupees. That was expected. So if you had bought it, uh, there's no, I mean, it's just unfortunate that this is listed uh, right after pretty terrible numbers from the IT pack. And that is why we're down 20 rupees at the moment. But just wait around. That's, uh, that's the only thing one can do right now. 22 rupees down now. It's just going down. Very, very bad numbers that have come in from um, the IT pack. Most probably people will have to just hold if they've got it and wait for this to recover because uh, it's a bad time. The volumes right now that you see at the bottom of about 11 to 12 lakh shares right now already traded, uh, LITI and Fitech, making a bit of a recovery. Let's wait and see what happens. It's just a bad time. That's, that's what it is for LNT Infotech. <clears throat> Let me go back to the discussion we were having with Mr. Sangvi. Um, you know, a time like this, uh, when you talk about liquidity coming in and therefore there's a P expansion, which is driven largely by liquidity, it's a tough time for a fund manager, right, like you? It is indeed because, you know, uh, while you have one eye on uh, the, you know, the underlying fundamentals of the companies and the market at the macro, mm -hmm. uh, the other end is the liquidity which actually, you know, doesn't factor into all these in the shorter end or shorter term. Mm -hmm. uh, and you see, you know, momentum pretty strong into the market, uh, which makes life definitely some uh, a little difficult for uh, the fund managers. Mm -hmm. But having said that, I mean, you know, we have seen long before, you know, long, long uh, in terms of this kind of environment. And we just know that at some point in time, this liquidity will end. And when it ends, it'll, it, it can be a little ugly. So what happens when you get in fresh uh, money into your fund, right? Uh, you can't possibly be sitting on too much cash. So you would have to deploy it. What do you do right now? What are you doing in the sense of which are the pockets you're looking at? On the contrary, I mean, uh, we, our, our is a fund where we can take, you know, pretty aggressive cash calls. Oh, you can. Because right. we are an absolute return fund and a long short fund. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, we have an, op uh, you know, option of getting, you know, taking these aggressive cash calls. Having said that, since the momentum is pretty strong in the market, we are hedged about 40%. Uh, okay. And uh, which is which is uh, on the near term pretty uh, uh, pretty aggressive position on the long side currently. Mm. All right, that, that's interesting. Aggressive position on the long side, um, and also a bit of cash, as you said, right? Absolutely. Yeah, because you know when you're getting money like these for free, I'm assuming that if you <laughs> people like you who got in when the markets were down. Uh, would be obviously taking some money off the table. Um, let me get a sense of some of the sectors which are now doing extremely well. And uh, they have been, like something like real estate, for instance. Now, there was a time where it probably made sense to buy real estate stocks because their value probably had gone down to even below the book value of what they held. Today, after this run-up, do you think that real estate is again in that danger of forming a bubble? Uh, two things. One, uh, let's let's disassociate real estate prices with real estate stocks. Mm. Uh, and in terms of real estate stocks, you know, uh, there is always an element of you know uh, a, uh, an element of what you are investing in and what is there behind in terms of the net asset values uh, yeah. of of their 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 own uh, projects. Mm. So we have never been uh, you know uh, big bulls on uh, real estate sector any which ways. Mm. And in the light that real estate regulatory bill is there. Uh, you know, which is pretty much in favor and I mean, it, it, it was a very welcome bill which was in favor of uh, the consumers more. Mm -hmm. It's going to be difficult for to manage the working capital requirements on a project to project basis for all these builders mm -hmm. because larger the leverage of a company difficult, more difficult is going to be for them to uh, uh, be on the growth path. Mm -hmm. So we think on a longer term basis, real estate stocks is uh, not something which we would uh, be keen on. Yes, we have seen rally. And we have seen momentum across names which uh, which we would any which way not, have not preferred. So mm. that's something which will you know pass by actually. Because you know every day what we do is in the morning when the markets open, it's uh, unfortunately our job is to give commentary every day. And I'm sure you don't have to even bother watching it. But what happens is that we tend to look at the high volume stocks and we say okay, a lot of volume in these companies, a lot of interest coming in. A lot of trading is taking place in real estate stocks. Highly leveraged infrastructure stocks come up suddenly, you see. Uh, they have also gained significantly in the last three months, if I look at them, right? as trading counters, perhaps. 
But if a retail investor is sitting out there and watching it, uh, I know the best option is to obviously go and get a mutual fund from Ambit. But uh, if they want to actually go and invest in stocks, they see that a stock is going up. They're highly leveraged. What should they do? See, again, uh, for assessing a company, there are two important aspects for us to assess any of those companies. One is basically the uh, capacity or, or the, the, the potential of an operating leverage and the other is the financial leverage. Yeah. The real estate sector, according to us, is, is a fit case of financial leverage. Mm. Uh, wherein if the interest cost on an overall basis comes down, it, there is a steady effect on the bottom line of these companies. Mm. Uh, yes, when the, inter the interest rates have been coming down, but not to the extent of what we would have estimated. Mm. Uh, two, we are on the ground, we are not seeing any much movement on the real estate per se, in terms yeah. of the transactions happening. Uh, and the inventory levels of all these real estate is pretty high. Mm. So yes, you might have some trading bet, but if you ask me for an investment perspective, uh, you know, I, it is best, uh, I would avoid. rather avoid it actually. All right, let me look at the big darlings of the uh, early aughts, you know, the 2002, uh, 2006, 2008 big infrastructure companies, which were highly leveraged, had got projects, were entering to power building airports, roads, what not, uh, they collapsed because they couldn't actually uh, make any money out of those projects. Those projects didn't go through. If I, but, and now they're heavily, still heavily indebted companies. Their interest coverage ratio sometimes is below even, what, half in some cases. What do you do with those companies? Do you think that the, refine, the recapitalization of PSU banks now makes it possible to look at these companies again? Okay, two things again. One is recapitalization of the PSU banks and these old infra companies. Mm. In case of the infra companies, we think uh, they have to sort out their debt problems. And unless and until they do, don't sort out their debt problems, there is not much of merit looking at them. Mm. Uh, on the side of the PSU banks... No, the reason I'm connecting uh, you have the two, to understand that, Mr. Sangvi, the stress. reason I'm connecting the two is that part of the debt problem that ha they have will have to be through restructuring because you can't suddenly expect them to raise some money and give it back to banks. Now, banks have the little bit of capital leeway to restructure. So, this is, this is why I'm trying to connect these two. If that is going to happen, in anticipation, okay. can I go and start buying some of these companies thinking, okay, their debt is going to re get restructured, their valuations will go up and I'll make some money. No, uh, so precisely the point why I was coming onto the banks is basically the capitalization for these PSU banks, I think, is to, uh, you know, uh, to, to, to put their own books in order to a great extent. I don't know whether they would be able to, uh, you know, continuously restructure because after the RBI norms, you know, and uh, you can't go and further restructuring the same restructured loans. Mm. So uh, I, I don't know whether they would be able to do that. They will have to go into an SDR mechanism or for probably other mechanisms of getting their act into place. Uh, but what I think is basically that the incremental credit is not going to flow from the PSU banks any which ways. Mm. Uh, because I think their first aim is to get themselves sorted out uh, and then go for lending at a later date. Uh, in case of the infra companies, as I said, they have to get their debt into order. Now, how do they get their debt into order? One, as you rightly mentioned, by refinancing their loans to an extent. Two, doing your aggressive asset sales, which they have, uh, uh, you know, lying with them, mm. and probably at a discounted rate. Yeah. We are yet to see those kind of aggressive selling uh, of assets by all these infrastructure companies. Uh, so are we'll there probably buyers? Wait, I mean, there uh, are buyers for productive assets, like let's say something like cement. We have found that there are buyers. There are buyers we found for power generation plants, which already have some sort of PPA. We saw that happen in the case of JP. But uh, are there buyers for uh, projects which are completed, sitting there? There is no pu uh, power purchase agreement. There is no co coal supply line from uh, Coal India. Why would I go and buy a company like that? even if I had money. Precisely. And that is the point what, what I'm trying to make is basically uh, the sellability of an asset, uh, if it is there, uh, you know, it's great. I mean, if you are able to sell that asset, but if it, you are able to, you know, uh, it's just lying at the book value in your balance sheet, in your PL, and mm. uh, but you are not able to get that value, uh, you will have to sell it a discounted, thereby doing a huge amount of write-off, actually. Mm. Uh, so, 
Uh, I'm not sure whether uh, whether you would want to buy. Secondly, actually, if you ask me on the celebrity of the asset, the government is pretty doing a pretty good job mm. by actually increasing the interest globally among the investors to buy into road projects, into uh, various other projects in you know where, right. where these infrastructures are probably infrastructure companies are stuck. So I'm waiting for that to happen, uh, and probably after that, once the balance sheet is streamlined, that is where you can probably look at. That we as a channel have been tracking Mr. Gadkari's roadshow in the U.S. Uh, where he's going and meeting investors and trying to get that money in. Uh, <clears throat> you know, you were talking about government effort to get foreign money in. Sometime or at a point when you have a bit of a crisis happening, and uh, I'm not just talking about an economic crisis, but a political crisis. And I'm going to try, uh, try and ask you a slightly un unconventional question. And uh, that is, if I look at what is happening across India, let's look at what is happening in Gujarat right now. You have uh, the Patel agitation. You now have a Dalit agitation. And there's a lot of talk that uh, there will have to be something done about youth unemployment. When that happens, a government has to go in and start supporting private uh, investors who generate employment, right? So infrastructure is one of them. Then what I, we'll end up with a similar situation that UPA was in, that you can't expand your fiscal deficit. So what you do is that you nudge PSU banks to start lending again. What is the guarantee that will not happen? The guarantee, I, you know, there is no guarantee in this world for anything, yeah. right? But it's just that uh, the path on which they are going on, setting up a bank board bureau mm. uh, and, uh, you know, holding accountable in terms of the people, in terms of decision making, mm. you know, it is very difficult to, you know, go back on that path. Mm. Uh, having seen the demerits of what has happened already in the last, you know, many years. Mm. Uh, secondly, you are right in terms of that the government definitely would be looking at the employment uh, and in light of that, you know, if you see the uh, Mudra Yojana, uh, which which the government has been actively pushing, they have been lending, uh, uh, you know, sizable amount of money to you know small artisans, small skills, uh, uh, people with small skills. Mm. That is something which which needs to be taken a note of because mm. that's self-employment plus they are going to generate uh, you know uh, more employment within their limited framework. Mm. Uh, plus their addition or their focus onto the startup uh, India mm. and manufacturing sector. I think over a period of time, this will start to show, uh, uh, you know, effect on ground. Effect. Uh, I'm no spokesperson of anybody, but this, yeah. these are the things which I think no, as a, as a are probably in the, the right direction. As a watcher of the economy, we are asking you about the way in which you assess it, right? I'm, uh, Mr. Sangvi, uh, let me get a, also a sense that you're a fund manager. Obviously, you talk to other fund managers. You talk to people who invest with big money. And I, I'm assuming that you would have friends who are angel investors and, you know, PE funds and stuff like that. A lot of money which would, liquidity which would otherwise have flown into perhaps the stock markets, ended up going to a lot of startups, especially last year. Now, if you speak to the startup space, you hear that tap has completely dried out. No one wants to give you money anymore because they think that you cannot generate revenue, right? Um, <clears throat> Is that money still around? Is there a chance that that money will actually come back into the markets? The money is surely around. It is just that they, you will see phases like this where there is a boom, bust, again a boom in terms of the cycles where people, one, that they are not aware of the venture capital investing risks. Mm. Once they are aware, they, are, they will be far more calibrated in go and go and investing into that space. Mm. It is just that first period where you saw huge amount of value created by these startups, people went and invested and had a little bad, bad experience. Mm -hmm. But if you ask me on a longer term basis, a longer term interest of an entrepreneur or India, I think this is the perfect line in which India can go. Larger the entrepreneur interest, larger are the employment uh, you know, opportunities which will happen into India. And this is, as I said, it's a cycle. Mm -hmm. Again, couple of success stories and you will see people coming back to uh, you know venture capital market. But uh, with perfectly understanding what are the risks involved. And once you are aware of the risks involved into the venture capital space, mm -hmm. then uh, you will see sustained money coming onto the space. Right. Um, okay, uh, since we're talking about startups, and I know this is not this uh, thing about uh, uh, listed companies at all, but I just want to look at the whether startups gave us a slightly wrong demand signal. The reason I'm saying that, that let's take a flip card, right? On a particular day, you go to Flipkart and type in uh, a particular thing, or Amazon, you go in, or any of these things, you go in and type in 
um, that two shirts, how much does it cost? And you see that there's a massive 50% discount. If you were not going to buy that, you might still buy it because it's so cheap. You might buy a pump, water pump, which you otherwise wouldn't have bought because they're giving you a 60% discount. When I go and look at the actual sales and movement of inventory, it looks to me that people are buying again. The demand has come back again. But whereas the demand is probably being funded by a venture capitalist, by, by someone who's put in money into the startup to fund those discounts. Now, um, is, does, does, has the startup economy sent us, or the e-commerce economy sent us, certain wrong signals as to the revival of consumption? And to, a, to, to an extent, that's right and wrong, both purely because, you know, it is always the case in the case of, you know, shifting from a culture of uh, actually going out and shopping to doing a net shopping. Now, if you ask me honestly, I mean, in my experience or my family experience and friends' experiences, if you would have asked me five years back, would you have gone and uh, gone on uh, net and done uh, you know shopping for you know all amount of things, the answer would have been you know straight no. Yeah. But today, what I am seeing is really across. You are seeing that shopping happening uh, on on the net. So what I am saying is basically there is a cost of mm. changing the culture of what it used to be to now what it is. Mm. Uh, no, I, this I is there that. now I understand the for the longer term. I mean, I understand the business model. I mean, whether that works out or not later is a separate issue. I'm saying that if I had to look at the fact that much of these sales probably were driven by discounts, but when I look at the inventory, for instance, there was one uh, e-commerce company which on a particular day sold 100,000 bikes, right? On that particular day, 100,000 bikes were sold. Now, the point is they were sold at massive discounts, yeah. which is funded by someone else. But when I look at bike sales for that month, on one particular day, one lakh bikes were sold. Now, that to me looks like a massive recovery of uh, urban demand. So I'm saying that that demand came at a very low price point, and effective demand, therefore, was at a lower price point. Once that price point goes up, that demand disappears. Have we misread that yeah. as data points? No. So, so the other way to look at is basically there is huge amount of pent-up demand which is there into the system. Right. which is waiting for an adequate price point to come in. Yeah. So I, I, you are right. You are saying that, yes, it was a blip probably, but that blip is something which, which, which was any which way the demand uh, there lying into the system. Mm. Uh, so it, it's not come from nowhere. I think you and everybody of us would uh, be, uh, you know, uh, I would surprise in terms of the demographic dividend and the demand which will arise from this whole demographic dividend. Right. Uh, so I would probably, uh, you know, be more optimist and say that on a lot of I guess my of question time, was more, more a short-term question, and I understand as a fund manager you really don't yeah. care beyond a point about the short term, <laughs> right? But uh, you know, when you look at it, the way in which valuation of some of these companies has gone down, uh, I hear that a lot of uh, people who invested are getting a lot of acidity and stuff like that, and they've had to pop pills because of the way they've seen their money fall. And that brings me to the question of pharma. You know, Indian pharma, a lot of things have come off patent, and when I talk about as acidity, one of the reasons is that we've just seen that omeprazole being launched. We're seeing some of those cholesterol busters, rosuvastatin, suddenly launched... Uh, by three companies, three or four companies on one day. Um, pharma, is that continuing to be a big bet? It is. We have started to get overweight on pharma, uh, and there are three to four reasons to it. One, on a historical basis, the valuations are looking, uh, you know, much attractive than it was before. Two, the whole derating of the pharma sector was primarily because of the 483s and the FDA uh, and the regulatory issues. Uh, what we are seeing in last one to two months is uh, these companies are putting in huge amount of effort and getting remedial uh, measures into place and getting expression of or probably EIRs or uh, you know getting approvals on their plans, which is a very positive sign. Uh, so if you have regulatory stuff getting into back into place, valuation set at the discount to the market on a historical basis, you have some money to be made on this sector. Uh, and thus, thus we, we are keen and positive in the light where the market are already much, much expensive. There are very less pockets of, uh, uh, you know, Value. companies or sectors where valuations to the mean are, are a little cheap. 
Right, Mr. Sangvi, thank you so much. Pleasure talking to you.